Yeah, thank you for letting me speak here today. Uh, this is a joint work with Joel and with uh, Nati Lineal and with Tal Novik. Okay. Uh, so feel free to stop me at any point and ask questions. And, uh, and uh, I was told that I should give some uh, introduction to not theory. Uh, so that's what's going to happen in the first uh, 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, so I apologize for the expert in the crowd. Yeah, okay. It's no need to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, okay, so notes. Uh, so no, you can think of notes as a closed curve in space. You can have this boring circle and we don't mind if we move it around or stretch it or squeeze it. We regard it as the same knot, uh, but we can make something more interesting. So this one may be a different knot, unless you can uh, move it around in a way that will create the circle, and then it will be the same knot, because we take all these curves under the equivalence of, a, of a moving them, but we, we don't allow to pass through ourselves or to uh, to cut it in, in pace, etc. So do you think it's the same knot? Or? No, okay. Okay, so, so these are knots, and this is our equivalence. We can move things around, and uh, this equivalence can be viewed as the isotopies of the space that embed the knot. So more formally, uh, we, we define a knot as follow. It's a map from the circle S1 to the three-dimensional space R3. And this map is considered uh, uh, up to these isotopies of m moving R3, stretching and squeezing it, and hence uh, transits the shape of the knot. Uh, okay, so uh, here are some uh, basic knots. So there is this, uh, so this circle is called the Al knot, and uh, maybe the first interesting one uh, is a trefoil knot, which looks like this, and you should also know the figure eight knot, which is, uh, which looks a bit different. You, you can recognize it by the figure eight, which appears there. Okay, so now we know three knots already, but there are many more. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, so I didn't convince you that these are different, uh, but uh, we'll see a proof uh, for something. Uh, we'll see if a proof that the tree fall is not a tree again. Uh, okay, uh, we can also define links. So what are links? Links are like knots, but with several components. So it's a map of, from the disjoint a union of two circles into the space, again. Two or more, uh, two or more right? Uh, so let's start with two. So some uh, two component links are the unlink, which is just two non-link uh, circle. If they are linked like this, it's called the half link. Uh, the whitehead link is another interesting link. And uh, in general, a link is called a split link if you can separate the two components by some sphere around one of them, like this one. Okay, so a split link is a sort of a trivial case. Um, the, these other links are trivial in, in another sense. The restriction of the link to any of the component is an unknot. But as links, they are different. Okay. And uh, as you said, uh, there are, you can uh, make links with more components. So this is a well-known link uh, of three components called the Borromean rings. And what the property? What happens if we rec restrict ourselves only for two components? If we forget about one of them, what do we have? Uh, yeah, the unlink. So it's unlink for any two of them. But uh, as a three-component link, it's not real. Uh, okay. So now we know not, uh, some knots and links. So 
it, it, it is uh, convenient to denote nodes and to study them by means of node diagrams. So what are node diagrams? We project the node from the three-dimensional space to R2, but uh, as we project it, we may have uh, some uh, double point, unlike the three-dimensional uh, curve, which is an embedding, so which is embedded. So in each double point, we have, okay, we don't allow more than double. We don't allow triple point, etc. And for the double point, we want them to behave nice, to be a uh, transverse. So the two, uh, the two strands must cross each other. And uh, in each of these double points, we mark what, which strand goes above and which one goes below, like here. Uh, so that's a knot diagram. Um, and uh, one reason that the uh, knot diagrammers, uh, no, first, uh, Okay, so uh, diagrams uh, were uh, these uh, tables of uh, not diagrams now can be compiled and uh, you can uh, sort out uh, all knots with, uh, with up to say seven crossings and there is a standard uh, a ter terminology where you write the number of the minimal number of crossing you can uh, you must use for some knot and then a serial number down there. And uh, such tables were uh, prepared for uh, up to uh, 16, uh, uh, up to 16 crossings by now. And uh, this work motivated a lot of knot theory actually, because if we want to prepare these tables, then we must decide A, when two knots are the same, and B, when two knots are different. So we, we want to prove these two sort of things. How many not about, about uh, between one and two million? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it must, uh, it's a most exponential, uh, like four planar graph. And I think it's also at least exponential with another constant. I I don't remember who showed this, but uh, it, it's not hard, I guess. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. So you can build some uh, some spe some special case of knots, which is at least well, I guess is it right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so let's start with showing that two knots are the same. So, uh, uh, about a hundred years ago, a uh, ride master came with these three moves with our way to change locally a knot diagram. And by these moves, you don't change the knot type. So it's, it's easy to see from the, these moves that if you replace this by this, or that by that, or that by that, you actually have the same knot. And the theorem is that these three moves uh, suffice. Uh, so you can move from any two diagrams of the same knots by the uh, uh, sequence of such moves. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah, so the theorem is that, uh, that, that uh, you can show equivalence by these moves, as long as you represent the knots by diagrams, of course. Uh, okay, and, and then you want to show that two knots are not the same. And, uh, f and for this, uh, uh, so uh, researchers, uh, so people came up with uh, the idea of not invariance. So let's define all sorts of function from the space of nodes to some any other set. And the uh, and the. Uh, before you talk about invariance, I mean because you presented a complete and sound proof system for equivalence of nodes to the Riedemeister nodes, it's clear that you can use them 
you can use it also for pulling the two things out this time. Oh, the question is just what the left, yes, you can. Well, you just have to prove that there is no... Yeah, but, okay. Yes, but there is an so you can use because the computer starts two six and then you have an upper bound. Yeah. The number of moves, if they were equivalent to moving in one and the other, yeah. you can use this. Uh, yeah, I, I've said something about it, but historically this is not Historically, this is not the way things happen, so people wanted to show that there's not a different way before these upper bounds on the right must move were known, and also practically that's not what you do. So, uh, uh, so no, and not invariants are interesting not only for this purpose, but as a general tool for studying knots, for understanding them, of course. So, so you, will, you will mention that the problem is beside the result. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just uh, that way, five minutes or so. Uh, I will mention, okay. Uh, in in uh, five minutes or so. Okay, but, but uh, let's first, uh, let's first uh, talk about some simple uh, not invariants. So there is one invariant that is very simple to define, which is the crossing number, the smallest number of crossing you need to represent a uh, diagram. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very hard to, to research it. I mean, uh, in order to compute it, you can compute it, but uh, by now we know to compute it, but you, uh, you have to quantify over all possible knot diagrams. So, uh, so that's one sort of knot invariance that uh, people consider. Uh, another knot invariant you can uh, you can consider is a knot group, uh, which is uh, the fundamental uh, group of the knot complement. We, we, we won't say much about it, but many, many, areas, ma many areas in knot theory regard this knot group, and it is uh, also more or less a complete invariant, so, so it, it is important uh, also to, to tell knots apart. And uh, so I won't show you the whole proof, but I wanted to, so to show you that two, di two specific knots are different. So the idea to show that the trifold is uh, non-trivial is by the following invariant. So it's called the number of uh, three colorings of a knot. So what is a three coloring? We color all these uh, segments. And uh, we, we can change color when the segment is broken, like, this, like here in this picture. And in each crossing, uh, the coloring has to, has to admit the following rules. You can have either one color at the crossing or three colors at the crossing, but never, two, two, or never only two colors in the crossing. Okay. So, uh, so this is the proper coloring. And you can uh, count the number of proper coloring of knots, and it turns out that this is an invariant. And how do you show it? You take all Rydermeister moves, and you consider all possible colorings of the two sides of the Rydermeister moves, and you count, and you uh, and you see that uh, uh, and you see it's the same number. So if it is preserved by Rydermeister moves, then it is an invariant. So, so this is the homework to, to, to show that uh, this is a really indeed an invariant, but uh, if you show that, then we can see that for the trefoil we have a non-trivial coloring right here, uh, which is a coloring not, a non-monochromatic coloring, and for the anode we have only those three monochromatic colorings, so, uh, so this must be different. Yeah. 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 Here you have uh, nine, and uh, for the anode you have uh, three colorings, so uh, they must be different. Okay. Uh, okay. The next invariant I would like to present is uh, maybe. What is the name of the guy who came up with the coloring? It's a special case of no general one, but some who came up with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It it is. Uh, it's not just an ab arbitrary rule. It turns out that this coloring hide in the knot group in group we talked about. So it's some uh, representation of the knot group into S three. 
Uh, okay, so uh, maybe the most classical invariant is an uh, invariant not of knots, but uh, of uh, two component links. So for if for each one two component links, we assign an integer now, an integer number, and it, it is defined as follow. You take a diagram of the link and forget about the coloring from the last slide. Here the two colors are simply the two components of the links. And uh, the link number can be defined as the number of these sort of crossings minus the number of that sort of crossing. So we only consider crossings where the blue component goes above the red component. Oh, so you fix that with an orientation of it? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I should say that uh, since the, those links are embeddings of S1, embedding from the circle or circles to, to the space, then uh, we have a notion of uh, oriented links. So we have an orientation for each of the components. That's right. And uh, so we fix orientation, we fix uh, two colors, and then we can uh, compute this uh, invariant. And we'll see that this is a not invariant. And so we, we have to show that this uh, formula is uh, well defined. In other words, preserved under, under the right master moves. Uh, okay, so for example, the linking number of this link, so this is uh, the Hof link. So it's plus or minus one depending on the orientations. And uh, we only have to consider this crossing because here we have read about the blue, so we, we take this one. And locally it looks like this, which is the negative crossing, so it's minus one. And for the other links, we get other numbers, so we can get zero even though the link is non-trivial, it's not the unlink. And uh, the, the idea behind this invariant is to count in some way how many times one component goes around the other one. So there is a precise way to put it. How many times... The precise way is to take the complement of one link and to and uh, to ask how many times the generator of the homology group of the of the complement uh, is represented by the other component. Okay, never mind. It, it's a it, it's a simple and classical link. It wasn't defined like this by Gauss. Gauss defined it by an integral. And uh, so let's show it's well defined. It's not uh, hard. Uh, so if we make a right master moves once, then we only uh, we only change the one component, either the red one or the blue one, this way or the or, or, the, or the other. So we 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 don't have any crossing from this sort. So the the linking number is preserved. Okay. Now let's see, what, what if we have a right master move of type 2? So if, if it's again the same, the same components here and here, uh, then, uh, then again we don't mess with this sort of crossing, the linking number is preserved. Uh, however, if, if these are different, then we may have such crossing, but not in this case, because in this case we only got the red one above the blue one. So again, the linking number is preserved by this uh, Reidmeister moves. And finally, if we put blue one above the red one this way, this sort of Reidmeister moves, then we have two new crossings of the sort that we count. But the thing is that they always come in different orientations. So I didn't mark the orientation here, but pick any orientation for these two uh, strands, and you can see that uh, the signs are always opposite, so again, the linking number is preserved by this sort of moves. And what happens for the type 3 Reidmeister move? So let's take, for example, these colors. So the thing with type 3 Reidmeister move is that we have the same crossing, but not in the same configuration as the plane. So this crossing goes to this one, this one goes here, and this one goes here. And it's always this case. So we have the same crossing in a different order, but for, the, for this summation it doesn't matter 
So any coloring, any, any way to choose the components between these strands wouldn't matter uh, for the linking number. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, so we prove that this is a not invariant. Okay, and so, so now a bit about the computational question. So th this is not the topic of this work or, or this talk, but uh, uh, I, I, I feel I must say something about it. it was since, yeah, yeah, uh, at least uh, since it's a computer science uh, seminar. Uh, okay, so, so, th so this is a very basic question in, the, in this uh, not theoretic. Uh, in, in not theory, I mean, because uh, this was a sort of motivating question because we because uh, uh, because of this compilation of all these uh, not uh, tables, uh, you you must have uh, ways to tell uh, when two nots are the same or when they are different. Uh, so uh, let's uh, start with. Uh, an easier question of telling uh, whether a knot is an unknot. So what do you think? Is this an unknot? Yeah. Mm. Obviously. No. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so how can you tell? So it, it can be very, it, it can be difficult uh, to take a, either a knot diagram, you can start with a knot diagram, or a, a polygon in space, and you want to tell whether it is an unknot. And, uh, uh, and the, the first uh, result is that uh, this question is indeed decidable. So there is an algorithm given by uh, Haken. And so what he does was basically to find a, a disk in the three-dimensional space which is bounded by this knot and, and, and uh, doesn't intersect it, of course. So this is a way to show that a, a knot is a trivial. Because once you have such disk, and then you can uh, shrink it along this disk to a small circle. Okay, so th this is the basic idea. I, I can say more about it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's... That's, that's uh, actually a good method, so that's the answer. And then the idea, most improvement known is complexity-wise, uh, uh, yeah. the combinatorics uh, in cryptography. Yeah, that's, that's right. So maybe I should say uh, a bit more. So it takes a triangulation of the complement, and then uh, you look for this surface in the complement, and this surface can come in a discrete there is some discrete description of this surface that you can find and you give bounds on the complexity of these discrete descriptions. So in each uh, tetraheader in the triangulation, there is a, a finite uh, number of possibilities and, the, and that, that's how uh, the algorithm works more or less. Uh, so there, there have been improvements to Huckins algorithm, and, and there are also many other algorithms. So other approaches work too. As you said, uh, you can uh, look for Reidmeister moves, and since we, we now have bounds for the number of them, the, the, that gives another algorithm. Um, another uh, idea is to look for a complete not invariant that you can compute. So uh, so uh, there are some invariants that are very complicated. Ah, thank you. Uh, but but uh, but you can compute them, and uh, since they they are complete in the sense that uh, they are different for any knot. Uh, so, so this is a, 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 a this is some line of re research to to give algorithms to tell knots apart. Uh, to find a complete not invariant. Uh, okay. Uh, 
So later, Joel and uh, his co-author showed that this problem is in NP and also that uh, some version of Hacken's algorithm can run in exponential time. And exponential, yeah. So you have a linear uh, function of n is an exponent. Otherwise, it just follows. No, no, so it means 2 to the O of n. Hey. 2 to the O of n. Yeah, so it's not x time. No. Yeah. Uh, okay, and uh, as for uh, co and p, so there is some uh, proof, but it uh, assumes a generalized uh, Riemann hypothesis. Uh, given by Greg uh, Cooperberg. Uh, so this is the state of matters. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't need the full power of the general Riemann hypothesis. It's a very specific uh, use, a consequence about solving uh, polynomial equations over the complex space, whether they reduce to solving polynomial equations over some large prime. Yeah. And uh, so it's used, it doesn't need the full yeah, oh, okay, yeah, that, so that's... Uh, so, going that's back, fine. It, it, it can make like a coin P, like join the two things and join the two things. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's, the w that's the way yeah, this uh, proof goes. Uh, so you, you solve those polynomial equations in, in order to find some witness of a difference between the two not groups. So, uh, so, so yeah. So, so this is the, the basic idea, and 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 since the the knot groups are a complete invariant, and uh, a bit a bit strong, more strong, uh, uh, yeah, a bit stronger uh, fact is that uh, you can find uh, you can find sh some. Uh, you can find some uh, finite uh, representation of these groups. Uh, so this is the idea behind this, uh, behind coin P, to, to use uh, those uh, invariants. Right. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> I, I guess, but... Uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think it's possible. Yeah. But there are not so many examples of things in NP that have to point to each other. Probably yeah. reducible to fast. So uh, the hash metallic token that is up is used, uses the rules that you showed before? No. No, no the Hacken's idea. I, yeah, it's uh, a version of Hacken's proof. Okay, so a, another question is, a, a, which is a bit of computational nature, is a, how many ride master moves do you have to make in order to show that this is the unknot? A, so also for this, a, a, there was some, a, there has been a, some work uh, so uh, the first uh, bound was uh, exponential, again by uh, Joel and uh, Lagarias. And uh, there is a lower bound by uh, Joel and Tal. Uh, so th th this is a specific knot diagram, which is represents a knot, but you, you, make to, you have to make at least some constant times the square of the number of the crossings in order to unknot it with Reidemeister moves. And uh, recently uh, there has been a, a much lower uh, upper bound of uh, n to zeta than by uh, luck and b. Okay. Uh, another proof it's in NP, yeah. Okay. yeah. 
Yeah, okay. And so, so all these results are for the unknotting problem. We still have this uh, wider uh, classification problem and uh, much less is known in general ab about, that, uh, about that problem. So... Uh, Uh, so I, I so I don't understand uh, much from all these uh, proofs. I mean, I, I read some of it, but, uh, uh, but there are all sorts of uh, ideas. Uh, <coughs> um, okay, so. Uh, so, so what about uh, other knots, uh, other than the R knot? Uh, so, uh, so, so le less is known. For, for example, uh, uh, it's not known to be solvable in exponential time. It is known to be decidable. Uh, the upper bound here. Uh, the up and bound here for the classification problem for the number of Weidmeister moves is a, a tower of uh, exponential height. So it's a, a very large number. And, and for every, every specific knot, uh, Lacken B announced that uh, his, his methods give also another polynomial bound, although the power of the polynomial is not, uh, is not bounded, it depends on the knot. So you, you recognize every specific knot, you are given a diagram and uh, you want to tell, is it a trefoil? So it's a... So it's like taking the classification when one of them is like constant size. Again? So, so I'm not sure. I, I don't know if it was published already. Mm. M maybe there is. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so let's leave uh, this uh, this uh, interesting area of computational problem and. Uh, and talk uh, about our our uh, yeah our subject today, which is a random knot. So first, I, I'm not sure that in this audience I have to motivate having random um, a good model for random knots, but I will anyway. Uh, so much work in knot theory so far was about uh, special cases. So there have been a lot of research about knots with few crossings and also about some special families of knots like uh, these ones which are the torus knots which are very special but a lot is known about them, crossing number, a knotting number, etc. Uh, so we want to understand how typical knots look like, what property uh, do typical knots have. So we have to define what's typical and of course typical will depend on the random model but again we, b we believe that this will give us more insight into knot theory and uh, in particular it, it would enable us to use a probabilistic method in knot theory. So here is uh, an example for what we could do. I mean, we are not there, we are far from there, but what we could do with the probabilistic method. So it's not known whether the Jones polynomial detects the unknot. So the Jones polynomial of the unknot, so the Jones polynomial is a knot invariant, which gives you a polynomial in t and one over t for every knot. And for the unknot, this polynomial is one. And uh, we don't know of any other knot that, uh, for which there uh, is a, uh, uh, the Jones polynomial is trivial, but uh, so it is open if it's 
uh, some people conjecture it is, but uh, it is open. And uh, we could uh, show it isn't the case. Uh, somehow, maybe using the probabilistic method, if we would come up with a random model for naught, for which the probability to get the unknot is one number, one function, and the probability to get a, a trivial Jones polynomial is a larger number. And then, unconstructively, we would be able to show that this conjecture is false. Yeah, yeah, of course. It, it, it's not an easy one, but it's a, a very appealing one uh, to uh, demonstrate uh, the power of the probability, the potential power of the probabilistic method in uh, not theory. Right. But, but there are other uh, invariants, other uh, questions that may be more detractable. Uh, okay, a another reason to consider random nodes comes from a very different uh, direction. So uh, nodes happen in nature. And sometimes it, uh, it is interesting to understand them. So if we have uh, thread-like molecules, like uh, plastic, like polymer, or, uh, or biological uh, polymers, like uh, protein and DNA, or all sort of these uh, molecules. So it may be interesting to understand the knotting. So th th there is some work about it. And nature is random. So uh, if we have many molecules, then it is sort of a random ensemble of knots that maybe would be interesting to understand. Okay, so uh, sometimes they are closed. Some uh, viruses have closed the DNA. Uh, in this case, they aren't, but uh, there are way to overcome it. You can connect here or connect this to ends to infinity and so somehow uh, I mean, you can make not out of this, yeah. Okay, so this is a, another motivation, and uh, and I should mention here also is that uh, since some problems may be hard in some sense, uh, in some computational sense, uh, some problems in not theory, so maybe we would like to use nodes as a tool for all sorts of uh, uh, protocols and uh, uh, photography. So the only example I've seen is the, this paper by uh, these authors, and uh, they suggested some protocol for quantum money that is based on a problem with uh, nodes. So. Uh, so this is from the paper. I don't know what exactly it means. Uh, it's a quantum dollar. You you can't use it. So you will not have it on your dollar. Okay. So okay. So that's another potential motivation. So uh, so after we are so well motivated, so let's uh, describe uh, some. Uh, 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 some uh, model, uh, some random model. Uh, so it is based uh, on work from uh, 2012 by uh, Colin Adams and a bunch of uh, students. And uh, it's based on this sort of diagram, which is called petal diagram. So uh, we'll build them carefully. Uh, we start by drawing segments. We draw more and more segments. All segments are straight and pass through the same point on the plane. And uh, after we draw such uh, an odd number of segments, we connect every other pair of them. So, so this gives you, yeah, probably you, you already see what's going to happen. So, uh, uh, so uh, but, but I want to stress that this is a given fixed planar curve. So it's a planar polygonal curve. Where, when you pass through the center, you go to the other side. You don't turn to some random place you want. And this is going to be, indeed, as uh, Doron uh, was uh, starting to say, I guess, that this is going to be the projection of our knot. So, 
So we would like to have a node that is projected to this particular curve. So, uh, so everything here is sort of fixed, a part of what, uh, what happens above the middle point. So above the middle point, there is uh, five uh, segments in this case come in five different heights, like here, you see. So all we have to tell in order to, in order to uh, decide what not it is, uh, what is a, a re relative ordering of the heights above the center point. So if, if you look at the knot in, in a sort of a mugshot, then you can say that the heights are one to five and on each strand you have to write a, what is its height and from this information you already have a, a knot. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll see. We see that, that you can. Okay, so this way we get random knots, another one, another one, another one. So if it's not odd, then it's all not one long curve, but a bunch of, thro of uh, so if, if, if it were. Yeah, yeah, but, but if you have four, so this is a, this is a, uh, this is not so pleasant a symbol to draw, but I think it's a, a Hela Virilia, the, the, Air Force, the German Air Force, but anyway, uh, th then you have uh, two different components. So this is a link. Uh, uh, you, you can, uh, Two mod four would give. No, it, no, it's only only two would give you one component. Any any larger number, uh, okay. I I want to erase that thing. Ah, okay. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so, a uh, a bit of a notation. A, a bit of a notation. So, uh, so uh, what we what we do is we redraw a random permutation, and this defines a random knot. And uh, to be precise, I want to uh, to specify how exactly. So, we we start from some point on the knot, and we read the entries in that permutation, and we write each number we read uh, beside where we are, so we, we pass through five, and then afterwards we, we pass through three, so this goes at height five, and then we go at height three, and then we go in another height, which is seven, so it's, it's above, it's above uh, the other two, etc. cetera, so, so uh, it's not so important, but it's a specific way to describe how a permutation defines uh, our knot. That's the notation. Okay, uh, so uh, w one more thing I would like to show before before we talk about uh, the wrong question. No, Avishai question. Uh, so if we take uh, one segment in our knot, so suppose this is the upper one, it goes above anything else, we can just uh, move it aside like this. Like this. And we get another representation which is less symmetrical, but is useful for some reason. So why is it useful? Let's squeeze it a bit. And then we can add another one with the same center point. So this, this is interesting because now we can uh, consider this sort of diagram as projections of two component links. So here we have uh, some multiple of four a uh, number of uh, segments above the center point and by a random permutation uh, on the four n entries we get a random two component link. So this extends the random model to two component links and you could as well uh, 
uh, get uh, three components, uh, four components, etc. Okay. Uh, so now to Adam's theorem. But but how how am I am I with the time? Yeah, Yeah, is there any break so I should? It's up to you, you can take five or ten minutes more if you want. It's 11.20, so okay. you can take a break uh, whenever it's convenient. Okay, so, uh, so we will take a break at some point, uh, I hope. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so Adam's theorem. So uh, what, what they showed uh, is that uh, you can create every knot in this model, and uh, I would like to show this now on the board. So, so what knot are, do you want to, to show, to, to have a petal diagram for? This mess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so let's do the figure eight now. So it's something like uh, this. Okay. So first step is to choose the base point, uh, which has to be on the exterior of the diagram. It will, it will be simpler, so we choose some point. And uh, in fact, uh, this is an oriented knot. Uh, so we can uh, travel from this point uh, along the knot back to the starting point. And as we travel, we, we, we were trying to record for each crossing point did we visit it? We visit each crossing point twice, and we we have two we have two options. Either we we went on the higher strand and then on the lower one, or on the lower and then on the other. So so we will mark these two by A and D for ascending and descending. So for example, which so which type is this crossing point? So we go first out, first on the upper one, and then on the lower one. So it is a descending. What? Is there any con confusion? Yeah. 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 We we, we fix it, and uh, we we choose it on the exterior of the diagram. So this one is extending because we first go below and then up, and it turns out that this one would be descending again, and this one ascending. Okay. And now we'll draw a line uh, that uh, divides the plane into two regions, where all ascending points are on one side and the descending points on the other side. So this line go like this here. This is the ascending area, and this is a descending area. Okay, so you can find such a line. In a Yeah, it is a finite set of points, and there is a, the only condition is, is that we don't want to pass through such a point. Uh, actually, uh, you can always find such a line that cross the knots in a linear number of places. And this is important, so uh, Adams didn't show it, but didn't mention it at least, but this will give us a linear complexity of the petal diagram in terms of the original crossing number. So, Anyway, you find such a line, and then we'll distort the knot, the, the, pl the planar diagram of the knot, so that this line uh, be straight. Yeah, so th this is the, the hard part of the proof, to, to draw this right. So we have here... 
<laughs> uh, so we have here this one, and uh, then it goes through here. Let's put the reference up. Here, and on the other side, uh, we have such configuration. Uh, this goes above. Uh, then this connects to here. Uh, do you watch me? Yeah. That I don't make mi mistakes? Yeah, that's not good. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this do not intersect. Okay, so this is the same picture, only distorted in, in some way. Uh, okay, and, and then. Okay, so, yeah, so yeah, so 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 let's uh, mention again that. On this side, all crossings are descending, and on this side, they are ascending. This is above. And what happens here? Okay. Uh, okay, so, so now the cool idea is to look at this a uh, so this is a the planar projection of some nodes. So we have to remember that, after all, it is a three-dimensional picture that we see here. And we look at this three-dimensional creature from above. So we stand here. Uh, OK, so we look from this point. OK, and since we, we are up there, we look from above, then this, this whole a straight line uh, will be just a point. Yeah, yeah. So, so we want all these crossing, all the not crossing, but all these points where we pass through the line to be at a given specific height when you look from here. And if we do so, then when you look from above, the line becomes just a point. And uh, and these uh, arcs are uh, going from this point to itself. And since this is descending, we can draw these arcs uh, such as they don't cross. Because Every two arcs, for every two arcs, there is an order on the arcs, and such as it, according to this order, every every arc is below the former ones. So this is a descending part. Ah, no, no, there is some. Let's start from the other part. It will be a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll fix that. We'll fix the, the number there. Okay, so on the left, on the left, on the left uh, part, we have an ordering because we start here. We first go on this petal. So this is petal. Uh, I don't know how to. Let's call it number one. One, uh, then no. We we'll need the natural number for another thing. Um, ah, that's good. Uh, okay, so uh, so this is petal A, and then we go no. Here on petal B, this is what B, C, D, E, and F. And the, the thing is that everything in A is below C, below E. So when we look from above, uh, we can draw it like this. This is A, then this is C, this is E. OK. And, uh, and the same here, between A and C, we have B, D. OK, and the thing with F is that this part of F is above everything. So it's here. This is part of F. 
And here we have, and since we tro we've chosen the base point on the exterior of the diagram, we can just take it to the rightmost part of the picture and then come from below for this part of f, which is, no, uh, maybe I confuse the two. Yeah, I confuse the direction. This is below everything, this is the direction. And then we have the other part of f, which is above everything. Okay, so, yeah, so it needs a bit of imagination to see things from above. Do, do you see it? Uh, but it's yeah, so, so the number of petals will be the number of intersections with that stretch line. And uh, now this is almost the petal diagram, and we've already seen that when we have this large petal above everything, we can move it with another color, let's say red, to be either above everything or below everything. This way, yeah, yeah, and, and, and here we have, uh, instead of this part, and here we have our regular petal diagram, so a very nice argument by Adams. And uh, so uh, we can actually write uh, the permutation, right, because uh, if these are the heights, so let's mark them by one, two, three, four, five, six. So our permutation will be five, then one, three, uh, six, four, two, and then we are in F, which is the last petal, so it will be above everything, so say it's seven. So seven, five, one, three, yeah, that's right, I recognize that is a permutation for the figure eight uh, knot. Okay, so that's Adam's uh, argument. Yeah, this is invariant under cyclic permutation in, in, in two ways actually. You can either add a constant or shift by a constant. And a and that's it. You can't do the figure eight knot with uh, less than seven. You you can do the you can do a lot more knots by nine. So let me give you an, an example. Which I just prepared. So you can play with this example and see. So as you look at it, you can see that from the side you can see all different heights, and from above you can see. It's a shape of a flower. So uh, this is a 3D print. I ordered it over the internet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, Joel, you will keep it. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, that's uh, a, a, and uh, actually a. Uh, So there are so you you can order from many places. There is a, a, a site called the 3D Hubs where you can choose where from where you order. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Okay, so ah, or maybe maybe I should mention that uh, these uh, curves were created by uh, by somebody. You can find her talk on YouTube, which do a lot of 3D printing. It, it does, it's not hard to make this curve, but, uh, but uh, I, I tried to contact her, but she didn't respond. But uh, since she, she offered online uh, all the sources, so I just use it. So this is a tree of oils. <laughs> uh, you can uh, pass them. Uh, well, it, it's tree oils with five petals. A bit strange. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can use the. Uh, uh, if you want her to become a not serious, then <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You can print some complexity classes. 
<laughs> okay. So uh, maybe we are near the break. So just another thing I want to mention about this petal diagram is that uh, when uh, you look out, at least when Joel looked out over the internet on all sorts of, uh, ah, uh, so, ah, maybe. Uh, he found uh, all sorts of uh, biological uh, molecules. So this is the DNA of some uh, virus. And uh, actually, this is the, the stage after he's dead in some sense. And no, he, no, it doesn't have to be that, not at all. Uh, but uh, but uh, it is w when you flatten this uh, virus uh, for some reason, the, which has to do with the research of this DNA, what you see is basically resembles these, those petal diagrams. So of course, it's not exactly our petal diagrams, but maybe since this representation of knots appears in nature, maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea to explore it even for these reasons. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, no, Joel, that that what I talked about that is your a gift from me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can have um, as much as you want. Eh? There was some demand on that part. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, can we wait for others? Maybe, maybe some other. Is it unique? No, not at all. Uh, no, it's not so. So how do you explain that it's random? So I mean, this is a thing with a random model. So you, you don't want it to be. You don't necessarily want it to be uniform on not types. You you want it to be interesting geometrically somehow, so maybe some not deserve to get a higher measure than other ones. Yeah, I mean, this would be the difference between different random models, which not are more, are more likely, and as a result, which, so which properties of not are wrong. Models? Yeah, yeah, if I have time, actually. Okay, so, so let's uh, continue. So yeah, so next uh, next we'll see uh, what is the the distribution of the linking number for a random uh, link. So. As you remember, we can uh, draw random links by uh, taking this 4n, in this case 12, this is 4 times 3, uh, segments over the center point and order the heights by a uh, random permutation. So this way we get a, a random link and we can take uh, more and more uh, petals. And uh, as we take more petals, so as n, which is the Basically, 4n is the number of petals. As it increases, we may ask what the distribution of the linking number would be. So first thing, we have to, turns out we have to divide by 4n, divide by the number of petals. So this linking number is expected to grow as we have more petals. 
and it is expected to grow linearly. And then, uh, Yeah, yeah, the Linky number. You, it's not at most linear. I mean, for some nodes. No, no, it's not a, it's not a sign. It could be. Ah, it is sign. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I wasn't uh, very precise. It's order of magnitude is expected to grow linearly. We, we'll see. We'll see. And. Uh, I should mention that in some cases it will be quadratic. So there are nodes with n uh, li links with four n petals and a linking number n squared. But uh, typically it is going to be linear and the limit is some distribution. So this is a weak convergence to a distribution density. So for every alpha and beta we can tell whether these and this normalized linking number is going to fall between two real numbers, alpha and beta, is, and it's going to be this uh, precise exp expression. And this, this distribution is uh, known, it's called the logistic distribution. Okay, so this is uh, some way to... Why is it called it? Uh, something to do with statistics, I don't know. Mm. So... Uh, so this is one way to describe the limiting uh, distribution. Of course, you may hope for more precise ways, more local ways to to tell exactly what's the probability for every linking number for every n, but this gives you the, the rough behavior of the linking number. And so let's look at, okay, okay so this is how this logistic uh, distribution looks like. So it looks like a Gaussian, but it's not. Uh, it decays uh, exponentially on both sides, other than uh, Gaussian, which is exponential uh, at, uh, in a square. Uh, so, and as you can see, you, you can hope for something more precise because as we do a simulation, here the blue line is a simulation, the red line is a theoretic, is, is, is a theoretic uh, distribution. So it's very close. So it, it's closer than you than necessarily follows from weak convergence. So you may hope for something uh, even more local. And okay, so let's say wh what does it tell us about the linking number of random not, not so first thing as we said it scales as n. Here n is sixty four, and it, indeed it's order of magnitude of. 64, plus or minus. Uh, and, and this phenomena is actually, here we, we verify something that was observed in another random model. So there is another random model, we'll talk about it later. This is what it looks like. And uh, what they did is uh, a, 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 some numerical experiment in which they uh, computed the linking number of uh, random uh, links. And uh, what they saw is indeed something that scales as n. So, so this phenomena happens not only in our model, but in another one. So uh, we'll say more about uh, some universality principles that we suspect that there are between It's uh, experimental. Yeah, it, it's experimental, but uh, actually they conjecture it's a Gaussian, but uh, now I suspect it would be logistic. But uh, that's another guess. Yeah. Could, could you, are you going to say uh, to what extent uh, the Every knot can be so represented, yeah. but uh, they might pile up. Uh, and there may be a lot of permutations that produce the same knot. Yeah, and that's right. one doesn't have really any good control over that or understanding of it. So when you're counting the, calculating the probability that the linking number 
of L4N shows up in some mm-hmm. brain. Yeah. Are you really, you're saying how many permutations produce a yeah. link to yeah. show up in that range, yeah. right? Uh, that whose linking number is in that range, right? right. Yeah, so th- this is the thing about random models. You, 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 you don't necessarily like a uniform measure of uh, all knot types or that. I mean, you, if, you, if you want to say something about the geometry of the knots, then you maybe, uh, as I said uh, when you asked in the, in the break, maybe some knots deserve to get a larger measure than other ones. So they are more likely. They're, they do better represent the typical knots. So. So the unlink, uh, yeah. So, so that's a that's an excellent question. The probability of the un- of a split link, and in particular the unlink at any link, is going to zero, and this follows from the weak, uh, from the weak uh, limit. Uh, Just the pointing zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, how fast? So we have some polynomial bound, and uh, and I guess that uh, it should be faster than that. So we, we don't know exactly. Yeah, for for both for both, what we have is a, polyno- a polynomial bound, not not by these methods, by other methods, because weak convergence gives nothing about the rate. And uh, uh, and, uh, but at least this is the first. Uh, this is the first thing to to check if you have a random model that uh, you don't get uh, almost truly a trivial thing. So, so we so we excluded that option. And uh, so so the probability of every particular link is is going to zero. At least we have that. We can also compute uh, what the probability to get a linking number no more than n, etc. And uh, another thing that we can learn from this uh, weak limit is that uh, if the probability to get at least uh, t times n for the linking number decays exponentially. So these large linking number like n squared, etc., are rare. This is not the typical case for random links. Uh, okay, so let's move for a, so a few words about the proof. So it relies on some uh, on some uh, on some uh, previous work works, and it happens to be connected to uh, another interesting problem that I'm now going to describe. So this is a problem of a random area. So, so forget about nodes. Now we are on the integer grid, two-dimensional grid, and we make a random uh, excursion. Uh, and we return to our started point. And uh, so uh, there are two options to, to decide how exactly. Uh, we can condition, for example, yeah. Let's say that we condition that after uh, two n steps, we get back to the starting point. Yeah, yeah, that's like, let's put it this way at, at this stage. Uh, anyway, we can uh, ask, uh, suppose this is a wire, a physical wire, what is the flux through this wire? Uh, and mathematically equivalently, it is a uh, what is the area uh, through this uh, enclosed by this curve? But we here we measure the signed area. So what's the signed area? If we if we have a square, we enclose like this counterclockwise. Then we count it in with plus sign. If we enclose it uh, clockwise, it's with minus sign. And if we go around the square twice, like this one, if we go around twice it will uh, contribute two to the area. And then we sum all these uh, numbers, and this is the- Why is Gauss was interested in this? 
No, no, I don't. I don't see a relation, although, although it resembles Gauss integral. But, but uh, it seems to be unrelated so far. I mean, you you will see what the connection is. Uh, so, uh, okay, so let's take a random, uh, a random closed uh, walk on the plane, and uh, it is known that this area we've just defined uh, is, uh, has exactly the same limit law as we've seen, so it is linear at n, the number of steps and uh, the limit is uh, logistic. So exactly the, the same law. Uh, so this was found by uh, Levy, who considered Brown and motion, and, uh, and Harper, which has some physical motivation for this. And uh, actually it was uh, reproved by Mingo and Nika, and I mentioned this uh, new proof uh, because uh, we adopted their methods uh, for the Linky number. So we have to change a bit <coughs> their methods to, uh, to, yeah, uh, to, to study the Linky number and then we could uh, extend them to other not invariants that has nothing to do with these areas and integral. Uh, so, uh, so why, why should it be the scale of n? I could say that if it's a random motion and you have a square root n typically at each axis, so the area should be around n. So you, you can see it makes sense. Uh, okay, so, but, but it's not exactly going to be equivalent to our problem. So here, if we have a closed walk on the plane, we have two conditions, that number of right should be equal to the number of left, and the ups should be equal to the downs. That's just because we want to return to our starting point. And another option is to consider balanced walk, planar walks in which all these four are equal. Okay, so, so this is going to be the difference. We will show now that the linking number of a random link uh, has the same distribution, exactly the same distribution of the area of a balanced random walk. So here for n is the number of petals and here for n is the number of steps. Okay, so wh why is it so? Uh, so let's take a random link. Now let's focus, zoom in on the center point. So in, here in the center, center point, uh, we see a 4n strands, which goes in all directions, but uh, we, we only want to record the general direction. So there are four general directions to go. Either we are at, in the blue component, uh, in which case we can go this way or that way, or we are in the purple component. So, uh, where we go along the other diagonal. So we, we, we write down all these, uh, all these directions, and in what order? In the order of the heights. So this depends on the permutation, the ordering in which we write the, the four N, these four N arrows, these directions. Okay, and then, okay, so, for example, the lower one here is going to be a purple one that goes this way, in this particular case, in this particular ordering. And now we read this list as instruction how to do a random walk. So, so if one is purple, I don't know, uh, southeast, southeast, then we go southeast. And two is again southeast, and go southeast. Because uh, this makes a butterfly, and uh, I don't know what this meant. <laughs> uh, it's probably the German. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
yeah, that, that's the thing. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, what? No, this is always the question. So that when, when we look at the mosque, we look from this angle. Ah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, after uh, we we were done with uh, this talk, we are, uh, uh, we are want to get uh, to our start starting point uh, where we started. So we get a random closed walk, and we can ask what is this, what is its area, and it turns out that its area is exactly the linking number. Uh, why is that? Uh, so let's see. Uh, what is a linking number? So if you recall the definition of the linking number, we only consider crossings where one component is above the other one. So you have the blue above the purple. And this can come in this uh, representation in four different ways, where the blue is above the purple. So here we only have one crossing point, but we can perturb things a bit only inside this circle to get uh, 4n over 2 distinct crossing points. And, and again, uh, we could read the type by these arrows. It's two lines through the circle cross exactly once. So if we do this perturbation, then we are counting crossing point of these four types. These two are plus, these two are minus. And, and when we do this counting, we can uh, write it as follows. So we consider all blue moves, we solve over the blue moves. And for each blue moves, we ask how many, what is the sum of the purple moves below it? For three, we consider two and one. For five, we consider four, two and one. So for each blue move, we sum the purple moves up to that blue move, which is the blue moves that we now consider. And then we have to, dif to multiply by the signs to get this plus and minus work. So you can check these four options fall into these summations. Uh, in, uh, for example, uh, if you have uh, this one and this one, you have a plus, and indeed here it's plus. Each of these four options gives the right sign, but this is exactly the integral of y position because the accumulated sum of the purple moves is our y position, and we integrate it according to plus or minus according to our purple, the change in our x position, which is a the blue axis. So x is the blue axis and y is the purple axis and this is exactly the integral and this integral is known to define the area that we've seen uh, earlier. So, so this is why uh, these two problems are equivalent. Uh, the thing is that this is only for a uh, balanced random walks and that result of Levy was for, for all random walks. So we, we could uh, find, uh, I guess we could find some way to, to reduce balanced random walk to non-balanced, et cetera, but we... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so yeah, so I'm sure it could work. Uh, however, we, we've chosen to redo the proof yeah, because... Changing the model is a bit more, uh, I, I, we wouldn't like to change the model because this is not all the information about the link. So we, we have still more coins to flip afterwards. It would, be a, it would be a complicated model if we change the model accordingly. Uh, but, uh, uh, okay, but, but, uh, but, uh, the, uh, We've chosen to, to redo the proof uh, because these methods later we extended to other not invariant where we could uh, learn more about, uh, about the density. So it seems that some miracles happen in the linking number where there are many methods and proofs for 
where well, there is this connection to area. And for other invariants that we'll see, uh, we don't have this miracle, but again, if we do the computation in a certain way, in a certain way, then we, we can, uh, then we can uh, learn about the, uh, the distribution of the other invariants. Okay, so uh, the idea of uh, Nika and Mingo's proof is uh, by the method of uh, moments. So, uh, what's the time? Let's see. So I won't say much about it. Yeah. Okay. So I won't just say much about it. Just uh, generally. Uh, so we start with a formula for the crossing number. This formula, or well, the sin heat, and we define m to be m n, m k n to be the case moment, and it depends on n at this stage. So here we. We take the expectation of a role permutation, so this gives us a moment of the distribution for n. And then we study this function, mk, and it turns out to be a polynomial in n. And the interesting thing is that uh, it is a polynomial, so by definition it is a polynomial of degree at most, we can show it's a polynomial of degree at most 2k. But uh, the, uh, we found cancellation in, in that expression, and we are able to show that actually it is polynomial of degree k and not 2k. And furthermore, we are able to uh, compute the leading coefficient mu k. And if we have the leading coefficient, then we have a limiting moment. So what do I mean by a limiting moment? Mu k is the limit of the expectation of m k n over n to the power of k. Right? For, for that from this expression, but but this means that for a no, no, I wrote mk inside, but I forgot to write it. It's a linking number to the power of k divided by n to the power of k. So this is a moment of the linking number over n. And the method of moments tell us that if we know the limit of all moments under certain conditions that we can check, we get a we get the limiting distribution, what it would be, it would be that distribution with the limiting moments. Okay, so, so this is the, the idea behind the proof and there are, there are all sorts of technical works and ideas that go in bit inside, uh, uh, inside the proof that uh, I, I won't mention now, or maybe I can tell about it later if if you're interested. Okay, so that's for the linking number, and now let's see what uh, for uh, final other uh, invariants. So uh, an important uh, class on invariants is that is called the finite type invariant. So we'll define that class on invariant, and then we'll see. Uh, okay, so now we are back to one component knots. So let's see. W w w let's uh, define singular knot. So regular knot, we in regular knot we don't uh, we don't allow double points. Let's say we do allow one double point or a finite number of double double point. So in this case, uh, we, we get something that is called a singular knot. And uh, what's nice about singular knot that if we have an invariant, which is basically a function from all nodes to both. So, so you yeah. so you can consider it only for diagrams. You can consider it for three-dimensional space. Yeah, it is a uh, it is well defined. Uh, everything here will be. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, th yeah, that's it. So yeah, so you 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 should imagine that that at some point uh, they coincide the two strands. Okay, so uh, so once we have a knot invariant, we can extend it to singular knots that follow. Uh, for a singular point, we can uh, resolve it in two ways. There is a positive way and the negative way to resolve it. Naturally, uh, either strand uh, should be above the, the other one. To resolve, you mean you want to really make it a, a uh, Yeah, a real crossing, and this would be, this would be a, a genuine knot, right? So, so we define the invariant of the singular knot to be the difference between these two resolutions of the knot. It's only? No, because the positive and the negative are well, are well defined. So, so they are defined for diagrams, and even in three space you can define it, and Tal showed, it, showed me a proof, a, a way to prove it. Suppose we have two strands with this on the notation, so this looks to me like a negative crossing, then it should look like a negative crossing also from any angle you watch it. Uh, okay, so uh, so there's a definition of uh, invariant of singular knots, and you can uh, iterate this definition. So you can uh, define the invariant for a singular knot with several singular points. You you resolve each point at a time. So for example, for this knot with three singular points. It will be assigned sum over eight knots, eight different knots, two to the three. Uh, so now, what is a finite tap invariant? Uh, we say that an invariant has finite order m if, for singular knots, for with m plus one singular points at above, it vanishes. Uh, so. One way to think about it is like function and polynomials. So this singular knot is like taking a deri derivative according to the singular point. And if you take the m's derivative of m plus one derivative of a polynomial, you get zero. So not all functions are polynomials, but some functions are polynomials. So again, some invariants are finite type. Some are known to be not of, not, not of finite type, of course. What, what, is the, what are the examples? So the linking number, I guess. I, yeah, it will be of finite about, type. I don't know, Alexander Polinomial. Okay, so they all appear in the next ah, slide. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. yeah. yeah no, no, that's a legitimate <laughs> question. Uh, but I think that the crossing number is known to be not of finite order. Of okay, so. Uh, so let's see, what are uh, order zero not invariants? It, it will be one, yeah. Zero are only constant, so. It, yeah, zero order is constant, like, in, like with functional polynomials, yeah. Uh, order one not invariants? Okay, so it's a link invariant, so we don't have a not invariants of order one. And one can show there is no such an invariant. Uh, you, you can do it as a homework. I mean, you only have to consider knots with two singular points and see that with these knots, you can just uh, show that any other one not invariant is actually has to be a constant. Uh, okay, so the linking number is uh, order one. And again, you can show it with, whenever you have two singular knots, then you have a sum above four options for two crossings, and you uh, and you see that they differ by one, and these two differences, when you take their difference, cancel each other. So the linking numbers turn to be of order one. And it is known that uh, some uh, polynomial invariant of knots called the Conway polynomial has coefficients which are uh, of order, the m's coefficient is of order m. 
So for example, C2 is an order 2, not invariant. And it is also known that the coefficients of the Jones polynomials, but not really the Jones polynomial, it's the modified Jones polynomial, because it's a Jones polynomial when we do some uh, substitution of a power series. So actually it's not a polynomial, it's a power series. But if you take the coefficient of that power series, you get a finite type invariant. And uh, these invariants are, are important. They appear also in a conservative integral, which is actually a way to write all these. And so this is a theor the theorem of conservation. It defines some integral, and it turned out to be a way to write all finite type invariants. So it, it is also some sort of a series whose coefficients are all finite type invariants, is the space of all finite type invariants. Okay, so one uh, major question in this field is are these invariant uh, complete? Uh, this family of events together, all together, is it a complete invariant? So are there two knots whose all finite up invariants agree? We, we don't know if there are any chance pair. Okay, so this should uh, convince you one way of the other that these invariants and invariants are sort of important. So this is a, a Conway light uh, Alexander. Yeah, 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 well, it's uh, some chains of uh, variable also. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so let's concentrate on uh, C2, which is a finite type invariant of order two. So this is one way to define it, and another way to define it is the second coefficient of the Conway polynomial. But uh, uh, yeah, yeah, there's only one uh, new one except for the constants that we already know. Up to a constant, yes. Uh, so, uh, so a more constructive definition is as follows. Uh, if you want to compute the difference between the Cousin variant of two different knots that differ in the sign of one particular crossing, this difference will be the linking number of the smoothing of this crossing. So what smoothing is exactly what you see in this picture. So for example, what is the Cousin invariant of the trefoil? This is a trefoil. I should say that the Cousin invariant of the n naught is zero, right? C2 of the n naught equal to zero. So what's this number? Do you recognize this knot? Yeah, it is R knot. You can take that part away and see. So this is zero and this is one. So it's a linking number of these two. So it turns out to be this is a half link. And we saw its linking number is one. So the custom variant of the R knot is one. So if you believe that this is well defined, that's another way to solve that the trefoil is non trivial. But you have to check that this is well defined, of course. So I, I brought this definition just to give you more intuition. So the Cousin invariant is sort of an iterated linking number that happens somewhere in, in the nodes. Okay. So there is another definition, but I'm not going to say much about it. Gauss diagram formula. Uh, so our results about the Cousin invariant is that we, we know the order of all moments. So we know the order of our magnitude of the Cousin invariant in the following sense. The case moments is a polynomial of n, n is the number of petals, with degree uh, 2k. Exactly, over 2. Exactly. 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 In this case, it, it, it's exactly, you will see why. Uh, so, So the thing is that uh, it can be n to the fourth for some nodes, but the order of magnitude we should expect is n squared. And, and this is what they say in the strong sense of being that way for all moments. For example, the expectation is n squared is this expression, and the variance is n to the fourth is that expression. So, uh, what's the next slide? Okay, 
So uh, as we said, its order of magnitude is n squared. It is interesting that if you look at the expectation before here, you could see that it is actually order of n squared. It's not zero as for the Linke number. So the Kasson invariant is not symmetrical. And uh, because its expectation is in some way strictly really positive one. And, and, this, and this is maybe, it's not uh, anything precise, but maybe it tells us something about the, the nature of the Kasson invariant. So this phenomena doesn't follow from any of these four definitions. I mean, any of these four definitions look rather symmetrical. No, no reason to believe it would be positive or negative. Uh, it would be a constant that depends on n, on n so, yeah. Or you may know that so yeah, it's positive in this strong sense that it's order of n squared. Uh, okay, uh, most things you can do, if you have moments, you can say all sorts of things about the probability. This is one example, I don't want to say much about it. You can, if you, if you have all moments, you can also tell what is the decay of the limiting, conjectured limiting distribution, so it should be faster than any polynomial. Yeah, it should be about a, a, a quarter. Actually, it's the... Yeah, 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 this is, that's the estimates that we get from, uh, from four moments. If we took six moments, maybe then we could get a better estimate. I thought we can get this moment. But by other methods, not by moments, we can show that uh, the probability of a zero Kasson invariant is going to zero. So our random model is not uh, that trivial. I mean, you 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 get you get a real knot, uh, a knotted knot. You don't have a guess. Uh, uh, no, I don't have a guess, but I have simulations. So uh, so it then it seems that there exists a limiting distribution with this shape. This is not symmetrical. It's not a. Uh, around zero, it's around one over 24. And we, we don't know at the moment uh, what this distribution is. We would be very interested to find what it is. Um, okay, so that's for the Kasson invariant. Uh, uh, what? Not symmetrical. Not symmetrical, yeah. It's not around zero, and it's also not symmetrical around its expectation. A strand distribution, a and we believe that it tells us something about the Kasson invariance. It tells us something about knots. I mean, of course, not in our random model, but we expect these sort of phenomena to happen in other models. Actually, we did simulation. Oh, sorry, on, on the last slide. Not exactly 